I had been a math major for a year and a half, and I decided I wasn't going to be a mathematician, and, and I wanted to, to do design, work with my hands. And uh, I continued my design major. I, I worked for a harpsichord maker a couple of um, summers, because I'm really involved with music, and it was interesting uh, working for him. And I learned a lot from him about craft and um, production craft. And I really got interested in sculpture. When I finally finished my major, I was going to go to the Graduate School of Design. And I uh, finally decided not to do that. And I, I felt I wanted to be a sculptor. Um, and I decided I'd try making jewelry as a way to make a living and do some kind of work with my hands. That, that was pretty much it. That was 1968 and was the beginning of the, the sort of hippie craft revival. Their wire jewelry was in its heyday in, in Cambridge. And um, I just bought some wire and started hitting it with a hammer. Well, I'm going to show you how we make jewelry here, and we're going to take um, two pieces and follow it right through the entire production. They're, they're really very similar. This piece, the plain pearl one, has been my best-selling uh, piece for ever since I did it, so it's probably eight, nine years. And this is a fairly recent addition that has um, stones, tanzanites in this case, and um, a different kind of pearl. The raw material is that we use is almost completely 14 karat yellow gold. We use a special alloy of gold that, that can be hardened in an oven when we're done. Almost every piece we start by straightening the wire. The, the original inspiration comes from the material. And in this case, gold wire is, it's very limited. It's, it's linear, one, you know, one dimensional almost. And what's amazing is how much you can do with, with a limited resource. And, and I, I know that my, in all my design work in school, that's always what I tended to do. I would, I would define some very limited thing, and then I would do something with it. And it, it always was very successful for me. I enjoyed working within that limited framework. Well, the, um, after we've cut out the wire lengths, the next step is to bend the piece of wire into a series of loops. And we'll show you later what happens to the loops. Um, but what Molly's doing now is she's um, making marks with a black permanent marking pen. And then um, these marks are guidelines for her making the loops. And taking a piece of tubing, uh, we have a whole series of different sized tubings that, that are, give us the, the, uh, the right curvature. So she's going to grab on the mark and loop to the next mark, and then shift the plier and grab on the next one. And that is going to become this soon. In the case of gold wire and, and forging, hammering gold, it's, it's a very ancient technique. I mean, old Etruscan, Greek jewelry was made that way, as well as other ways. And there's some very basic forms that come from the material. Um, uh, the hoop earring, which has been around for thousands of years, um, is, is just totally classic. I, I have maybe 10 styles of hoop type earrings in my line. And they're all a single piece of wire in a hoop, but they're all different from each other in, in how they're formed. It's the metal and its, limit, its limitations and its, its, abil its ability to be hammered out and stretch in different ways and be bent into uh, gestures and to create, like drawing where you have lines, you create three-dimensionality through lines in space. 
Uh, and that's what it is with, with, that's one thing you do with wire, you create. We create an object, a feeling, a gesture with the wire. And I've been doing it 30 years and I'm, I'm amazed. I keep being able to do new designs. I really, it's, it's, it amazes me that, that there's more to do. And there probably always will be. Well, this is my uh, workbench and we're gonna bring and, uh, these pieces that we've bent and, and hammer them and form the uh, bracelet. But the first thing we're gonna do, which we do every day, is to polish the, the hammer and the anvil that we hammer the jewelry with. And this is really very critical because as I'm hammering on the gold, it's really like die striking the surface of the hammer and the surface of the anvil into the metal. And if there are imperfections there, they'll get stamped onto the jewelry just as though um, I'd intended it to be there. And we don't want to have to polish that out if we can help it, because we want to leave as much of the integrity of the piece as possible. And now that's uh, shiny enough to shave in, you might say. If we're doing a lot of hammering during the day, we might do the uh, hammer um, three or four times during the day. It doesn't take very long. So now we're going to hammer on the pieces that we've looped out. My goal is to flare out each loop, starting at the mark with no hammering and flaring out wider and then tapering back down again. Then after I've gone up and down each side, just getting it, getting it started, then I'm going to go more carefully over each, each loop and fin finish them off. One nice thing about uh, forged hammered jewelry like this is the hammering makes the gold harder and it makes it a lot stronger. And you can see as you're hitting this gold with a steel, the metal's getting very compacted. So forged um, jewelry like this is, can be light but still very strong. Now go down the other side. The pieces look heavier because of the use of, um, of hammering in different directions and creating planes and the illusion, the illusion of three-dimensionality by having curving planes in different directions. You create the sense of, of a sphere, whereas you just have a little gesture of the gold. That's one reason that it's light in, in weight. And um, another reason it's light in weight is because forged gold is very strong and you can go quite thin and it's still very strong. But it also gives it a, a wonderful feel. The lightness is part of the feel of it, part of the movement and the, and, and the feel of wearing it and, and seeing it. So I, I see the lightness as a real advantage and probably the, it's the mainstay of the whole concept and the reason it works. It's the combination of its value. It's, you know, beautiful, handmade, designed jewelry at a reasonable price. And it's, it's that, it's the technique, the forging, and uh, the, the, the technique of the wire that makes it possible to do that. And um, there's the piece flared out. It wasn't important that we keep it straight, and you'll see why later. At this point, we're going to put the quality stamp on. And I have this little stamp that says TK 14K. TK is my uh, registered trademark. And a 14K tells anybody it's 14 karat. If someone buys this piece um, 30 years ago from now, looks at the stamp, they'll look it up in the book and they'll know who made it. There we go. When I first started making jewelry, which was in um, the late 60s, there was a, a ring that everybody made in wire jewelry and silver called the S ring. And this is how we made it. We took a piece of wire, we bent a loop, bent it into a loop like this, hammered it out, and 
And then the magic part, you grab one in this way, this, this end can go back, and this end, is, this end is gonna come towards me, this end is gonna go back. And you open it out like this, and you get this S form, like that. And that's the design element. So what we've got here is um, a series of these loops, just like I showed you, and we'll open them up and we'll get a series of these S's, which will end up being the bracelet. And the amazing thing with a bracelet is that when you're finally finished, the gold and the pearls all blend together into this solid look, and you really don't think of it as a bunch of wire opened out. It, it all melds together. So we grab one side with the plier, the other side with the hands, and we open out the way I showed you with the brass wire. Now I'm not going to go all the way because I want to be able to keep the two sides even. And then we just go down the line, and we're doing the same thing with each one in sequence. And we're getting this ruffly piece. What I'm doing is trying to keep them even, trying to make both sides open to the same amount. So go back from this side again. I was very musical. I was involved with, um, I was in a junior choir that sang with the Chicago Symphony and um, I was very interested in dance and as I am today in music and dance and my mother was a musician and my dad was a mathematician. But, you know there's this connection between math and music that no one quite knows what it is exactly but it's there and I don't know I feel that in my jewelry. As an inspiration there's, um, there's a classical Ma almost, you know, mathematical kind of feel to my jewelry, whether it's um, through the curves or, or the repetitive forms, and the, it's the proportions. I mean, proportion is incredibly important, and a piece can be, can make it or lose it on proportion. The same form, the same idea. Um, from the brass sketch, when you go to the piece of jewelry, what the scale is going to be, what the proportions, how heavy the metal you start with, and you can start with heavy metal and make a small piece and get a very fat thing, you know? And then you can start with thinner metal and make the same form bigger and it's very spindly. Okay, and that's, that's good enough for now. And it's ready for the next step, which is um, gonna be melting the end of the wire to make the, um, the little bead that's gonna be the hook for the clasp. And it, you have to have a little ball on the end so it isn't scratchy. And so that, so that when you come here, it makes a nice snap close, like that. So we just dip the end of the wire into the flame, and it melts it very quickly, and that's all there is to that. Gives us just the little ball at the end. Then I make a hook, both ends. And I twist each hook up 45 degrees so that they'll come together in the end at about the right spot. Now we're going to form it into a bracelet. After we do this, we're going to um, hammer it on a, uh, a bracelet mandrel, which is a metal tapered form. Now we have the bracelet just roughly formed, and we'll snap it shut so we can hammer it on the, on the bracelet mandrel. There are markings on here for different sizes that we're going for. Okay, that step's done. 
it's been trued now into a much more um, regular oval shape. We want to make it lie, um, lie flat on the table, so we need to come in and move some things around. We go for all the S's are touching the, touching the table. We're going to need a little hole in the last S's here because these pearls are on a wire that's wrapped around, but it goes, the wire goes through a, a little hole in the end here and that gets melted. And this is the first, really the first quality control step in the piece. The jeweler who just made the piece knows if there's some little thing that needs to be corrected and they'll do it now. Before we polish it, because we heated these ends, there's a little oxide on them. And we just need to um, put it in the pickle, which is an, an acid bath. It takes a very little time. There's just a very light coating, but it won't polish off. Once the acid takes it off, then it polishes really well. And I'll just go around and get the surfaces that are the most important. During this step, I'd be looking for a little problems if there was a little pit that came from the hammering. Okay, well, the next step on this piece that has the stones on it is to um, solder on the settings for the stones. And um, what we use here is a, uh, a little uh, tacking, electric tacking machine, which is, it's like a welder, but it isn't as strong. It just very lightly attaches the setting on here so that it keeps it in position for soldering later. And I have a little diagram here that, where I'm going to mark where they're going so that I don't get confused in the middle of doing it. Just a guideline, the, the ink will come off later. The, the tweezer is uh, connected to the positive terminal and this copper plate which is touching the bracelet is connected to the negative. And if I went at the point where I touch positive and negative, a small spark will be created, which will tack this down in position. Just like that. So we're going to solder these heads on. The little heads that are going to hold the, uh, the stones, we're going to solder them down. We've, we've tacked them in position. The uh, green part of my flame is flux. We have um, flux that mixes in with the acetylene that, that uh, keeps the uh, jewelry clean as it's being soldered. The gold in its softest state, in its annealed form, has fairly large crystals of metal, and, and that makes it softer. And as you hammer it, you're hammering these crystals, and they get broken up, and they get jaggedy and smaller and interlocking, and it makes the gold stiffer and it makes it a lot stiffer. Um, that's called uh, work hardening. It happens if you draw metal down through dyes to make the wire thinner, or if you forge it. It makes it very stiff. And that's the wonderful thing about the forged metal. It's, it's very compact. It doesn't have any, doesn't have any porosity. Um, like castings can have a lot of pores, air in them. Well, the problem that we solve by having the, the heat treatment is that if you, if you solder a post on an earring on a place that's thin, that will soften that spot. It will anneal that spot. So the, the great thing about the heat treating is that it'll bring that spot back up to the hardness of, of the forged piece. If you'll remember, we, we pre-finished this upstairs with the Tripoli. The jeweler was looking for any little spots that were problems. And now down here it's going to go through two stages of automatic finishing. One that's going to give a very light, um, gentle cut uh, of the whole piece, and the second one which will polish the whole piece. This um, media is walnut shell that's had a very mild um, polishing compound embedded into it. And so it's dry. There's no water in it. So we'll turn this on and show you the, the action of this. Every once in a while you can see pieces of jewelry popping up 
and coming down. The, the big advantage of the automatic finishing, which is something that, that can't be done by hand at all, is it gets inside every little nook and cranny completely evenly all over. If you try to buff by hand some of these inside places, you just can't get at them. And some other pieces that are more complex even, there are spots that with a hand buff you can't get there at all. So the automatic machine gives it a good shine inside and out. And then at the very end we do a final hand polish. The person who's polishing is also an important um, quality control step. So the uh, polishing compound is getting cleaned off in the ultrasonic cleaner. Gemstones are a very important part of our line. We, we have a large variety of stones, um, semi-precious and uh, also diamonds, emerald, ruby, sapphire. And um, Jody is our gemologist here. She uh, started five years ago doing the GIA courses and she's completed the colored stone courses and is just finishing up her diamond grading. These stones are SI1s that's what we order and so there are going to be some inclusions but I pretty much look to see that nothing's under the table or any chips on the stone or anything that would be visible to the unaided eye. This is the way the pearls come when we get them from the supplier. We get a, a big hank like this with the pearls all strung up. The pearls need to be graduated on the piece. So we start out with a, a long pearl on either end, and I'll select those out. Um, then we got, uh, after we put a long one on each end, then we graduate from small to large so that we have the largest, prettiest pearls across the top of the bracelet so that it looks nice when it's worn. Um, so I will pick out those pearls quickly. We try to make nice pairs, if you notice the um, the way the design of the bracelet works, each one of the um, S's um, is filled with a pair of pearls that match each other. You can and probably see this better in, in a finished one here, the two, the pair of pearls there. And we're quite fussy about that. Uh, it's a very small difference, say, the difference between this pearl and this pearl, but these ones match nicely and it really does make a difference in the ultimate look of the piece. So this is a small piece of uh, 23 gauge gold wire that's had a little bead put on the end. We just put it in the torch quickly and it beads up so that when we put it through the hole that's been drilled, um, it catches nicely. And then I'll just go ahead and string these pearls up, starting with one with the full end uh, first, and then I'll just alternate them. Now the trick with this wrapping is to get them tight and I've had a lot of experience doing it so I just have a feel for it. I, I set this pearl in position put a little bend in it just by going back. I'll slide this pearl down and I'm going to make a little bend just at the right place in that direction and then I wrap the wire around and then I get to put a little bend in there and now that, that pearl has been set in position, it can't, it can't change. It's got a little bend at both ends. And I'll come in the same way and get that one. And, and I'm, I'm doing this under continual tension. You can't really see the tension, but, but I've got these pearls in my hand and I'm pulling. I'll do the last one with a plier because it's there's not as much to grab onto. We usually give ourselves plenty of extra wire. And then take a clipper, clip off the excess wire, push the wire through the hole, 
lever it up a little, get nice and tight. And then we would go to the torch and melt that little end. And it, and it can be, it, with a big, nice strong flame, we can melt that right back. That's a good snap. And then I'll make sure it's lying nice and flat. If I need to, I'll adjust the shape. Sometimes I need to push up on the pearls a little bit to get them, shape them in. And it's finished. Except it's going to get steamed again. It, gets, it goes downstairs again and gets steamed and then packaged. So now we've brought it all the way around to the finished one that we, that we showed you at the beginning. And you know, I, I say this to everybody I, I hire, and I really believe it. Is that even if we're making all this jewelry every day, that every piece is gonna be bought by someone for whom it's special and who's gonna treasure it. And um, you have to believe that. And you've gotta put it into the piece as you're making it, everyone is special and everyone is a little different. Thank you.